You know, earlier this year, I had the privilege of uh, traveling to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I was blessed to speak at a conference. It was about a thousand middle and high school aged youth. And uh, we were in the Smoky Mountains, and I had the privilege of speaking to these young people. It was a winter revival for these thousand middle and high school aged youth. And I remember that after I finished preaching, the altar was filled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people who were either rededicating their life to the Lord or some of them were making a profession of faith for the first time ever, y'all. I mean, the altar was literally filled with young people on their faces in the presence of God. And it was such a beautiful sight to behold. But if I'm honest, when I got back to my hotel room that night, I was convicted because what I realized is that those young people were in a place of passionate pursuit of Jesus. And even though I had been traveling the world and I had been preaching and teaching the word of God, if I'm honest, y'all, I had become too comfortable with God. I had become too familiar with God. And it became convicting to me. And I said, Lord, I want to get back to that place, that place of desperation for you, that place of longing for you, that place of pursuit of your heart. And y'all, over the last eight, nine months, God has been doing a work in me. And as I was praying about what he wanted me to share here this morning, I believe that what he wants for every single one of you under the sound of my voice is to return to that place of desperation for Jesus. He wants to do a revival in this place. He wants to resuscitate some of us in this place because some of us have gotten a little bit too comfortable. We've gotten a little bit too familiar with the things of God. But I believe that by the time we leave this place today, he's going to restore, renew, and revive us. And if you agree with me, place your faith in line with mine and we're going to get there. I'm going to be in the book of Luke chapter 8. Our text is going to come from there. I was told this is a women's emphasis weekend and there's a story of a very familiar woman in scripture that we're going to look at. Oh, you can have your seat for a minute. I got to give you some backstory. I love it though. Come on. They said we're ready for the word. We are up ready for the word. I will tell you when it's time to stand. We're going to read the word together in a minute. We're going to be in Luke 8, but before I get there, I need to set the table just a little bit. So academic institutions and corporations will oftentimes host a program called a scholar in residence. And what this program does is it will bring in the outside expertise of someone to help the organization solve a problem that it doesn't have the internal expertise to solve. That's a scholar in residence. Well, uh, as uh, Pastor Brown mentioned earlier, I was hired at Facebook to lead their global faith partnership strategy because at the time, 80% of the employees were either atheist or agnostic. And Mark had decided that he wanted the company to serve the global faith ecosystem. So they didn't have anybody on staff who could do that and so they brought me in they hired me on the team to bring a level of expertise that they did not have and because I was open about my faith from the beginning I told everybody that I followed Jesus that I was in pastoral ministry because I was open about my faith from the beginning they started to refer to me as the Christian in residence now it was an interesting title that actually opened some doors to conversations. Because again, most of my colleagues were either atheists, they didn't believe in God, or they were agnostic, they just weren't really sure. But I would have conversations with them about my faith, and it was interesting because I would find over and over again that even though they thought that the idea of believing in God was kind of weird, they actually didn't have a problem with the person of Jesus. Like it was interesting, you know, they actually felt like what they knew of Jesus resonated with their personal values and their ideas about humanity, the idea that we should be gracious, we should be compassionate, we should fight for the marginalized, we should stand against systems of oppression. In their mind, Jesus was a cool dude, so they didn't have a problem 
With Jesus, their problem was with the people who professed to follow Jesus. Because, see, they could not understand how people who profess to follow Jesus could be so unlike him. Which raised a question for me. How is it that people who can quote scripture like their social security number can be so unlike the Jesus of the Bible? And as I was thinking about that, I remembered that there is a term in geometry called adjacent. To be adjacent to something is to be near or next to. So for example, we would say that this auditorium is adjacent to the lobby, right? It is near, it is next to, but it is not inside. If we were in my house, we would say that my kitchen is adjacent to the living room. It is next to the living room. It is near the living room, but my kitchen is not inside of the living room. And so today, for those who take notes, I want to teach from the subject adjacent faith. Adjacent faith. Now we're going to be in Luke chapter 8. Right before we walk into our text, there's a synagogue leader. His name is Jairus. And uh, he, was, he was frantically searching for Jesus in a crowd of people. Because his daughter was dying in his home. And he believed that if he could just get Jesus to come to his house, that Jesus could heal his daughter. So he's frantically searching for Jesus. And he finds Jesus. He tells Jesus the situation. And Jesus agrees to follow him to his house. Now, if you want to join me in standing for the reading of the word, this is where we find our text. Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 42. The Bible says... That as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and she touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, she came trembling and she fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So most Bible commentaries, when you look up this passage of scripture, they describe it as an illustration of the importance of believing that Jesus can do impossible things. They describe it as an illustration of the importance of placing your faith in Jesus. And I believe that that is partially true because you see, faith is simply belief plus action. That is what faith is. Faith is, I believe this to be so, and therefore I'm going to act on it. To give you a concrete example, if you have faith that God is going to bless you with a car, you would probably go and start cleaning out the garage of your home, right? Because you believe God is going to do this and so you would act on what you believe. So we see in this story truly an illustration of faith because she believed that Jesus could heal her and so she acted on it by pursuing him and, and touching the edge of his garment. Now. If we only focused on the headline of the story, though, we would actually miss what I believe is the bigger point. I'm going to shift our vantage point ever so slightly. Instead of focusing on the woman for a moment, I actually want us to zoom out and focus on the crowd. Because you see, if we take in the bigger 
visual of the crowd, what we will come to realize is that this story demonstrates that you can be near God and separated from God at the exact same time. This story illustrates to me that if you are not careful, you can be in the presence of God while being entirely unchanged by the power of God at the exact same time. For me, this illustrates adjacent faith. You see, according to Mosaic law, because this woman had had this issue of bleeding for 12 years, she was deemed unclean. And by being deemed unclean, what that meant is that anything and anyone that she would touch would also be unclean. And because of that, she was isolated and she was ostracized. She was made to live physically on the margins of society so that she did not make something unclean. Now, put yourself in her shoes for a minute. This woman who has been made to live on the edges of society... She's heard about this miracle working Jesus, this man who has healed the sick and raised the dead and caused the blind to see and the lame to walk. And she hears all of this and she looks over yonder and there he is walking through the crowd. The one that has the power to heal. You see, this woman had tried everything. Over the course of 12 years, she tried everything imaginable, but there's her solution within her eyesight. And I can imagine that a flicker of hope ignited in her heart as she saw her solution walking through the crowd. But just as quickly as that flicker of hope ignited in her heart, I can imagine that it began to extinguish because she remembered that she couldn't get too close to anybody or else she would be shunned, she would be shamed. And so her mind began to flood with questions. She said, how can I touch Jesus without him turning away from me in disgust? How can I make my way through the crowd without being noticed? How can I access my healing without being shamed? And so she devises a plan, y'all. She decides that she's going to get on the ground the ground that was laced with animal feces, a ground that was laced with trash and spit and people's dirty feet. She decides that her healing was more important than her appearance. So she gets on the ground and she crawls over to Jesus and in faith, she reaches for the edge of his cloak and she receives her healing. But something unexpected happened because, you see, while Jesus did not see her face, Jesus felt her faith. And so he said, who touched me? Which is actually pretty astounding if you think about it. Because he's in the midst of a thronging crowd of people pressing up against him and yet he said who touched me I believe that although that crowd of people wanted to see Jesus she was the only one who was pursuing Jesus which begs the question when was the last time that you were so desperate for Jesus that you were willing to do anything in order to just touch the edge of his cloak? When is the last time that you had such a longing and a thirst for Jesus that you were the first person in the building because you didn't want to miss anything? When is the last time that you praise God, not for what he did, but because of who he is, because he is good and he is faithful and he is kind and he is a father how many times have you looked up to heaven and said God if you never do another thing I thank you because you've already done more than enough you see although the multitude pressed against Jesus she was the only one who pursued the person of Jesus although the crowd enjoyed being in Jesus' presence she was the only one 
who wanted Jesus's power. The crowd was satisfied with having an audience with Jesus, but this woman wanted an indwelling of Jesus. And this is why one of the major dangers of growing up in church, one of the major dangers of even serving in leadership in the church is that if you are not careful, you will confuse being near the things of God to having a relationship with God. You will confuse proximity to the person of God with actually understanding the power of God. And that is why today I came to tell you that if you are walking in adjacent faith it's time out it's time out we're not going to be next to Jesus we're not going to be near Jesus we're not going to look like we know Jesus at the end of this service today we're going to have an indwelling of Jesus for real for real if we're not careful we will make coming to church the proxy for being the church and I believe that God is coming for that today because our adjacency to God will make us complacent with God. And that is the most dangerous position to be in is when you are near him, but separated at the exact same time. One of my favorite theologians, A.W. Tozier, he wrote an incredible book. It's called The Pursuit of God. And he said these words, he said, how tragic that we in this dark day have had our seeking done for us by our teachers. Everything is made to center upon the initial act of accepting Christ, a term incidentally, which is not found in the Bible. And we are not expected thereafter to crave any further revelation of God to our souls. We have been snared in the coils of a spurious logic, which insists that if we have found him, we need no more seek him. The stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth, acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted, too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long in vain. Which brings me to all of us. There are three signs that we are walking in adjacent faith. And I'm gonna share the three signs with you and then I'm gonna help you to be equipped to walk out authentic faith. I'm gonna share the three signs uh, collectively and then I'm gonna take them individually and explain. The first sign is that we gather to watch, not to worship. The second sign is that we know of Jesus, but he doesn't know us. And the third sign is that we can see sin in others while overlooking sin in ourselves. So let's take the first one. Let's take the first one. We, we gathered to watch, not to worship. Y'all, the crowd was there to watch Jesus. They wanted to see what he was going to do, what miracle he was going to perform. They're like so many of us, nobody in this room right now, but so many of us that we come to church to receive a word. And if we happen to miss worship, that's okay. Because we're there to receive a word. I thank God for the new covenant, y'all. Because you see, under the old covenant, we would have had to walk in here with, with sheep and, and bulls and lambs and, and birds and all of these animals to sacrifice on the altar. But because Jesus was the propitiation of our sins once and for all, now and forever, he is the sacrificial lamb. And because he is a sacrificial lamb, we no longer have to worship by slitting the throats of animals. We can worship with our mouth. We can worship with the fruit of our lips. We can worship with the lifting of our hands we can worship with the running of our feet and because of the finished work of the cross the only gift that we can offer to God is our worship so how dare we sit back with our arms folded watching the worship as if it's our entertainment you know, it's interesting, as I travel around and I preach, people always ask me, they say, hey, do you wanna, you wanna stay back here in the green room until it's your time uh, to speak? 
Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You see, there are no celebrities in this room except for Jesus. I owe God my life. So how dare I act like worship is optional? How dare I treat the worship like it's my opening act? Adjacent faith will have you believing that you're just there to watch. I'm just there to see what they do. When you are living in authentic faith, what you know is everything I am and everything I have is a gift from the hand of God and therefore I worship him with my all. I worship him with every fiber of my being. I thank God for the musicians that are sitting here because y'all, I'm a musician as well. And one of the things that I have noticed over and over again is that we will have people do their part in the service and then go to Instagram. No, 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 no. Our part in the service is our life. Because see, worship is not a song. Worship is a way of life. It is when you surrender your ideas and ambitions and your dreams and your hopes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When I stand here before you today, I'm not standing before you because I'm some gifted communicator. I'm standing before you because God opened the door. And because God opened the door, he gets the glory. God is the one who gets the praise. God is the one who gets the worship. I'm not standing here because of who I am. I'm standing here because of who he is. And when you know that, Worship is a lifestyle. You know why we have so many arrogant Christians? Because we are believing the lie that it's because of me, because of my gift, because of the way I look, because of my money, because of my position, because of my title. But let me tell you how God works. When you decide that it's because of you, God steps back and says, okay, let me see what you got. Let me see what you got. If you want the favor of God on your life, you have to have a heart of worship. And a heart of worship requires the humility to know that everything I am and everything I have is a gift from the hand of God. I did not go to Walmart to buy a speaking gift. I don't think any of you probably went to Target to see how I can buy a you know, gift on the guitar or the, or the organ, no. God gave us these gifts. And so we return it to him as an act of worship. The second sign of adjacent faith is that you know of Jesus, but he doesn't know you. I love how when Jesus was walking through the crowd, and everybody was pressed up on him. I love how he said, who touched me? And the disciples were so confused because they were like, everybody, Jesus. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me. There's somebody in this crowd whose belief and action met my power, which makes me wonder, when is the last time that you surrendered your schedule to Jesus. I've had people ask me, Nona, how do you hear the voice of God? And it's actually very simple. You hear the voice of God by spending time with him. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. How do sheep know the voice of the shepherd? Because they spend time under the shepherd's voice. They obey the shepherd's commands. That's how you know the voice of God. But y'all, one of the most sobering passages of scripture for me in the Bible is found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. It says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not drive out demons? And in your name did we not perform any miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, evildoers. You see, the crowd, they heard about Jesus. 
They knew of Jesus. But it was the woman with the issue of blood who pursued Jesus, who prioritized connecting with Jesus, which makes me ask you, what's your relational life looking like? How much time are you spending studying the word of God? Praying, not for God's hand, but for his face. How much time are we spending in repentance? Hear me. How much time are we spending allowing God to show us ourselves? God, how am I off with you? God, show me how I have failed your expectations. And how often are we going before God with a broken and a contrite heart? And we're saying, Lord, show me me. Because I'm not, I'm not happy with just having a pretense of righteousness. I want to be righteous for real. We have to spend time with God. We have to prioritize it, y'all. Because only through spending time with God will we understand his voice, y'all. Many years ago, uh, I was driving back. My husband and my family, we were driving back from the beach. And y'all, I hear the voice of God audibly, all right? I, I've attuned my ear to where I can hear his voice audibly. And uh, we were driving back from the beach. And I heard the Lord speak a word to me. We, we were driving down this road, and there was a man. He was on the side of the road, and he was cooking barbecue on the side of the road. And y'all, it was pouring down rain. But this man was out there cooking barbecue. And I heard the Lord say, give him 500 dollars now if I was by myself that would have been easy but see you have to understand my husband is very what's the word um, thrifty very thrifty and so when I heard the Lord say it my heart started to raise I was like, oh Lord how am I gonna say we need to give this random man $500 uh, but I, I turned to my husband I said hey I said uh, the Lord said we need to give that man some money and he was like what I said, yeah, the Lord said we need to give him some money. And so we, we, we made a U-turn. We went to a Bank of America. And when we got to the ATM, you know how on the ATM it will have like the, the quick selections, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100? So he turns to me and he says, how much? And I was like, you know, like 100. And he was like, $100? I said, yeah, let's just do 100. So we get the $100, we go give it to the man, and uh, we're driving away, and the Lord said, I didn't say $100, I said $500, y'all. We get down the road, I said, hey, we, uh, we gotta go back to the ATM. <laughs> I said, uh, God actually said to give $500. He was like, $500? Now, have any of y'all ever seen in Living Color, the, uh, the Chris Rock? character where he would like go into Popeye's and they would be like, it's $3 for a, a chicken box. And he'd be like, $3? Good Lord, that's a lot of money. So my husband, he'll be like, how much for the skin? I have to get the skin, the crispy skin. Um, so I said to my husband, I said, he said to give him 500. My husband, the color left his face. But because he is a man of God, he said, all right, well, if God said it, then we're going to do it. So we went back, got the $400. Gave it to the man. The man was crying, like crying. He said, God has heard my prayers. And so we, we get home, y'all, and I'm, I'm thanking God. I'm like, well, all right, Lord, you know, we did what we said you don't do. Y'all, the next day, I got an email from this uh, company. I do leadership uh, talking as well. And got an email from this company. And they said, hey, uh, we just want to know if you'd be willing to do a 30-minute uh, virtual talk to our staff. Uh, can you check your calendar for the dates? And I said, oh, sure, I'd love to do it. And they, once, once we locked it in, they, they got back to me and they said, okay, um, uh, we'll pay you $5,000. So, God said to me in that moment, he said, Nona, when I can trust you, there is no limit to what I will do for you. You see, we think that faith is us trusting God. But let me help you out. Uh, God is God whether we trust him to be God or not. Faith is not us trusting God. Faith is God being able to trust us. I'm going to say that again because some of you didn't catch it. Faith is not us trusting God. Faith is God being able to trust us. That when he speaks, we will obey. 
And this is what separated the woman with the issue of blood from the crowd. See, the crowd was just there to watch. She was there to live out faith. She trusted that Jesus was who he said he was. And she acted on what she believed and she received her healing in that moment because of her faith. And that's what made Jesus say, hold on, somebody touched me. Does your faith touch Jesus? Are you the kind of person that when God speaks, you don't need an entourage? When God speaks, you don't have to check it with mom and daddy and sister and brother and cousin and uncle. And No, when God speaks, this is what it is, and so this is what we're doing. See, some of us, we won't move until it all makes sense. <laughs> but y'all, that's not faith. Let me help you. If it makes sense, it doesn't require faith. It's when it doesn't make sense and you don't have the blueprint and you don't have the roadmap and you don't have the resources, but you've heard the voice of God and so you're moving in the direction of that voice and that voice is coming out of the darkness. That voice is coming out of the void, but you know the voice of God because you spent time in the presence of God and you trust the voice of God. That is faith. And he wants to revive that in us today. The last insight I want to give you on how you know you're walking in adjacent faith is that you can see sin in others while overlooking sin in yourself. You know, when I go back to our text and I imagine that woman crawling across the ground, I realize that the reason why she crawled across the ground is because she was trying to avoid being noticed. Because in that culture, if they saw her, they would point to her and they would say, unclean, unclean. They would point to her and they would back away from her and they would shame her and they would stigmatize her. And so she crawls along the ground because she doesn't want to be noticed. But you see, while she crawled along the ground, what they missed is that while she was physically unclean, they were spiritually unclean. You see, she had to crawl along the ground. She had to pass by fornicators, liars, thieves, murderers. She had to pass by all these people who had the sin that they could hide. She wore hers on the outside. They wore theirs on the inside. And we have to get to the point that we recognize that God is not impressed with how we adorn our outer appearance because he's looking at the heart. So we can look holy and we can look put together, but what's happening in our heart is death and decay. And today God is coming for that because he wants to revive us for real. Y'all, I'm not interested in looking holy. I already read Matthew 7. I'm not trying to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have Jesus say, I'm sorry, and you are. Could you imagine? We have to get to the place that we are so honest with ourselves about where we are that we stop looking down on other people. You know, some years ago, I invited a woman to come preach at our church and she did an amazing job, amazing job. And after she finished preaching, I got a call from a woman at our church, another woman. She uh, called me and she told me that she was so disappointed that I allowed a woman who had been married three times to preach in our pulpit. She was so disappointed that I had allowed this so-called Jezebel to stand in our platform. See, what she didn't know is that the woman who had preached had been married for 20 years. Her two divorces were the result of abuse, domestic violence. But this woman who sat on her high horse judging this other woman thought that she was in a position to call somebody a Jezebel. But what she didn't know is that I knew her story. Yes, she had been married for 30 years, but the reason she even got married is because she got pregnant out of wedlock and the families forced them to get married and her and her husband didn't even like each other so I'm sitting here listening to this woman tell me why I shouldn't have her preach in a pulpit but she wasn't taking care of her own mess adjacent faith 
will cause you to be able to clearly see where others are off and overlook what's happening in your own life. Y'all, here's the thing. As Christians, yes, we are called to hold each other accountable. Absolutely. But my Bible says in Galatians 6 and 1 that if a brother is caught in a sin, if a sister is caught in a sin, those who are spiritual restore such a one. When we get to the place that we think our job is to condemn and not restore, we are walking in adjacent faith. You have to know this, the reason why that crowd did not touch Jesus is because they were so full of pride, thinking about how good they were, that they missed the heart of Jesus. Y'all, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Which is why today, I want to do something as we stand here. Uh, I'm closing, but 12th century French abbot Bernard of Clairvaux, he said something really powerful. He said, the one who is wise will see his life as more like a reservoir than a canal. The canal simultaneously pours out what it receives, but the reservoir retains the water until it is filled, then discharges the overflow without loss to itself. The people who crushed against Jesus were just human canals. They were just there to see what Jesus would do so that they could go home and tell everybody what they saw. Maybe there's somebody in this room right now that you've been living your life as a spiritual canal. You come in here, you get the word, and it just kind of passes right on through you. You leave, you leave the same way you came in. I came here with news today that that ends today. We're not leaving this place the way that we came in. We're going to leave this place as spiritual reservoirs. So if this message is for you, I want you to stand in the presence of God because we're going to receive transformation today. We're going to receive wholeness today. We're going to receive newness today. I believe that when you leave this place today, there's going to be a passion reignited on the inside of you, a longing that's reignited on the inside of you, a pursuit that's ignited on the inside of you so that just like that woman with the the issue of blood when you reach out to touch the hem of Jesus his garment you will experience his power I'm tired of so many of us coming in here and the presence of God is so thick in the room but we can't even experience it because we're so separated from God father as we stand in your presence today I ask you Lord to restore within us the joy of our salvation I ask you God to renew our hearts and renew our minds God help us to remember that you are the only wise God. Help us to remember, Father, that you first loved us, that there is nothing that we have done, that there is nothing that has happened to us that has disqualified us for relationship with you. I pray that whoever stands under the sound of my voice that has been experiencing a lukewarm relationship with you, God, ignite our hearts today. Ignite our hearts today, Father. May we not leave this place the way that we can in and today father we ask you to do what only you can do restore deliver set free once and for all we believe that you are who you say you are we believe that you can do what you say you can do so today we refuse to allow a lie of the enemy to make us think that we have to stay the same oh no today we are reborn through the power of Jesus today we are renewed through the power of the Holy Spirit and we will never be the same in Jesus name